Good evening, and thank you for watching. My name is Hank Stevenson. I'm the co-founder of the Arizona Agenda, a daily newsletter covering Arizona politics, and I'll be the moderator for this evening's debate. The Citizens Clean Elections Commission is the sponsor of this event. As the state's voter ed education agency, Clean Elections hosts debates so voters have the opportunity to hear directly from the candidates, ask questions on the issues that matter most to them, and vote informed. Candidates that have a contested primary election have been invited to participate in the debate. Candidates that have opted into the Clean Elections Clean Funding Program are required to participate, while traditional candidates are invited and encouraged to attend. Please note, candidates from the House will be participating tonight, uh, and none from the State Senate. When voting in a primary election, voters are choosing between candidates of the same political party, so their preferred nominee may advance to the general election. As the moderator, I will ensure candidates have the opportunity to engage directly with their respective opponents. The questions that will be asked this evening are coming directly from the voters. Leading up to the debates, Clean Elections conducted outreach to voters across the state asking for questions for the candidates. Additionally, Clean Elections surveyed voters to learn what issues are important to them. The survey data, along with input from experienced journalists at the Arizona Agenda, the Arizona Capital Times, the Green Valley News, and Sawarita Sun, have been utilized to guide the discussion so it best serves voters. Of course, we want to hear directly from you, the voter. Voters that are watching this debate live, you can submit a question at any time. To do that, email debates at kc-a.com, or you can text them in 480-808-1814, or you can even call them in 480-937-1253. We do screen questions for clarity to eliminate duplication, speeches, or personal attacks on candidates. This debate is scheduled for about an hour, so we may not get to all audience questions, but we will do our best. Candidates, you will have one minute for your opening and closing statements and one to two minutes for responses to voter questions. We encourage an open exchange of dialogue between the opponents. If you feel the need to respond to another candidate's comments, you may do so. I may limit responses for time management purposes, and we remind the candidates and the audience that this is a respectful, courteous, and professional environment. Our goal tonight is to connect candidates to voters so our electorate can vote informed. Uh, tonight, we have uh, two candidates for the State House of Representatives and Legislative District 17, which covers Oro Valley, Marana's, uh, Marana, and the area north of Tucson. Uh, the two candidates joining us tonight for the contested primary in the House of Representatives are Anna Orth and Sherilyn Young. Also running for the offices are Corey McGar, Kirk Filer, Rachel Jones, and Robert Barr. The Senate candidates are Senator Vince Leach and Justine Wadsack. Uh, they did not opt to join us tonight. Um, thank you both for being here. We really appreciate your time and taking uh, you know, a chance to speak directly to the voters. Um, let's start with the opening comments. And uh, Anna, if you wouldn't mind, why don't you start us off? You're muted. It's bound to happen. There we go. <laughs> Thank you for the opportunity to be able to have this forum to talk to our constituents. So a little bit about me. I'm a fourth generation Tucsonan. My family has been in Pima County long before it became a state. I have a deep connection to this Southern Arizona community. People know me and they have long known what I stand for. Uh, I've been in business for over 30 years and have uh, a professional background, not only in small business, but in corporate sales, management, and organizational design. I hold a master's in industrial and organizational psychology, and I've been helping organizations in my work and in a volunteer capacity to identify their issues and create solutions. As a mother of three grown children, I have a great appreciation for the needs of the family and how important it is that we protect our children, our next generation. As a candidate for the Arizona House of Representatives, I have three main reasons why I'm running. First and foremost, having had direct exposure 
as a volunteer in the election process here in Pima County, I stand firm in the fact that there was not only fraud and deceit, but gross negligence in the process of our elections. And I'd like to use my experience and my skill sets to bring some organization and integrity back to our elections. Uh, second, I'm running because I believe we need better attention and follow through on our existing laws and policies that encompass securing our border, uh, our immigration policies, that they benefit the US and Arizona and our own citizens, uh, protecting the rights of parents in all things for their children and defending our rights and freedoms as it was intended by our, our founders through our constitution. And third, I'm running to be your next state representative for common sense legislation and to put Arizona first. I would appreciate your vote and your support. Thank you. Thank you so much, Anna. And Sherilyn, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself? Good evening, I'm Sherilyn Young and I'm running for Arizona House of Representatives in our new legislative district 17. I'm a retired OBGYN doctor and I've lived in our district for 40 years. I, I grew up in a very poor family. Um, I was the first uh, in my family to ever graduate from high school. So it was quite a surprise when I was offered a full scholarship to UCLA. I went to UCLA, I followed up with a teaching credential and then I went to medical school. I feel very fortunate and I'm very grateful to the taxpayers. Um, for offering me the opportunity for a good public education. And I just hope that all the taxes I've paid over the years have more than made up for it. I, um, I've tried to give back to the community. I've served uh, as Southern District Director for Arizona Medical Association. I've served on the Governor's Commission for Maternal and Child Health Care. I've served on the Tanka Verde School Board as the President. I served on several other boards in the community. And um, presently I'm serving on Pima County Election Integrity Task Force and um, as president of Pima County Republican Women. I'm running for the state legislature because I think the next two years are really important in terms of pushing back on federal overreach in our state. State legislators are really the the officials that determine your everyday life. They're the ones that you have access to, they're the ones that you can influence, and they're the ones that control things in your state, such as education, elections, business, um, infrastructure. I think it's gonna be real important for the legislators to maintain state sovereignty over the next couple of years and to keep the, the government from overreaching our, our uh, state. So I, I, I too hope you'll vote for me. Thank you so much. All right, let's just jump into it. I've got a couple of questions coming in from the audience already. Um, let's start with some questions about jobs and economy. Um, Governor Doug Ducey won office pledging to cut state income taxes down to quote, as close to zero as possible, end quote. Yet voters approved Proposition 208, which raised income taxes on high earners to better fund education. What are voters telling policymakers with these two conflicting votes? And at what rate do you think Arizona should tax income? And why don't we start with you, Anna, this time? Okay. Uh, well, uh, that was quite a few things. So first, I think you're talking about Proposition 208, which was overturned because it, uh, it violated the Arizona Constitution because it infringed on uh, the legislators, legislature's power to allocate tax revenue. And, and also because it exceeded the appropriation limit on education. So that's important that we, we, you know, we realize that it wasn't just that, that it was overturned for no reason, but there was reason for that. Um, and I think, I'm sorry, that was, what else did you ask? What are the voters telling you by approving Prop 208 um, and, uh, you know, voting for Doug Ducey, who has pledged to cut income taxes as low as possible? And basically, where should our income tax rate be? Well, I, I'm a proponent of, of no income tax, but a flat tax is the next best thing. So lowering the tax burden on our on our taxpayer is something that I'm more 
uh, in line with and in favor of. Uh, as far as money towards education, there are, I don't know if you want to get into that right now, but there's, there's other factors to consider. I mean, we already have a budget for education and adding 208, I think was a, was an effort that many taxpayers find themselves in where if they don't vote for something for education, it looks as if they don't have an appreciation for education or children. And if they vote yes, then they have to accept that their taxes are going to be uh, increasing. So uh, as far as what Doug Ducey has done, I, I don't speak for him. So I don't really know what his intentions are or, or why he did that. That's probably something you should probably cover with him. And we'll get into more about the state's education funding system. But Sherilyn, what do you think? Um, what are voters telling you with these two conflicting messages? On the one hand, they're saying, we like Doug Ducey who promises to cut income taxes. On the other hand, they're saying, we wanna raise income taxes. And where would you set our income tax rate? Is it too high, too low? Well, Hank, I think what the taxpayers are telling you is that they're, they're human beings with, with uh, human nature and that they want their taxes to be as low as possible, but they're fine taxing wealthier people. Um, as far as the tax rate goes, recently four, four tiers of taxes were reduced to two tiers. And over the next three years, it should go to a flat tax, which is gonna be 2.5%. Now for a family uh, who has gross income, uh, a married couple filing jointly who has a gross income of $100,000 would have a taxable income of about $75,000. And at 2.5%, they would owe about $2,000 a year in taxes. Now, I think that seems pretty reasonable, but that can also be adjusted either by, um, by whatever goes, whatever state revenue we manage to bring in and also by legislative uh, action. Okay. I also want to talk about is it something that's on everybody's mind these days. Gas prices have skyrocketed in the last year. Arizona adds an additional 18 cent tax on every gallon of gas to pay for road maintenance and construction. Just a few years ago, policymakers were considering increasing that tax, which has been unchanged since 1991, to cover in uh, transportation infrastructure projects. So I, I'm curious, would you support suspending the gas tax to ease people's burdens at, burden at the pump? Um, and if so, how would you make up uh, the, the funding to pay for roads? And if not, do you think we should increase the gas tax? And Sherilyn, let's start with you this time. Um, I think 18 cents is not enough of a decrease to make it worth doing if we're going to put our infrastructure at risk. So I would say, no, I would not be in favor of suspending the gas tax. I think the real issue is that um, gas prices are high because of the moratoriums on drilling. And I really think that we need to put an end to that and start drilling um, and producing our, our own oil rather than trying to buy it from countries that are hostile to us. Um, as far as in the future, right now, our state is in pretty good shape. We've got about a $5.8 billion um, slush fund. Uh, and I don't think that we need to increase ta taxes on people right now when they're really suffering with inflation. Thank you. Anna, same question. Uh, is the gas tax too high, too low? No, actually, I... I agree with um, with Sherilyn that it it would affect other areas of our infrastructure that the gas tax is already in place for. Um, but I, I do know since we do have a, a five billion dollar surplus, it might be helpful to uh, instead of taking it from the gas tax to maybe return some of that in, as a benefit back to our taxpayer during this difficult economy. Uh, clearly, 
addressing our, our energy issue with being able to bring back uh, our ability to get our oil domestically would change everything. But from a state level, from where we stand, if it was something until that's taken care of appropriately at a federal level, um, my thought is not to touch the gas tax, unless it was just for a, temp a temporary uh, time, maybe three months, maybe six months. Uh, I, I would say just off the cuff, that might be something that we could look at uh, specifically about the gas tax. Gotcha. Okay. I want to talk a little bit about infrastructure and specifically infrastructure in the new uh, legislative district 17. Um, what infrastructure project in your district, if any, would you fight to get state appropriations for in the state budget? What's the most pressing need of LD17? Uh, me? Yes, please. Okay. Well, I, I don't have a specific project in mind, nor is it something that people have brought up to me as an issue. But clearly, water is always the number one issue that Arizona is challenged with. Uh, transportation uh, and economic issues as far as our small businesses uh, with some of the federal overreach with mandates uh, and supply chain issues because again, because of the gas have all taken uh, a role in, in affecting our infrastructure. So if I believe that if I were elected I'm sure I'll get a thousand emails on what we will need, but specifically, uh, I don't have one. But if I had to, I would I would say we might want to look into uh, our water desalination uh, option that has been on the table. So that might be something I would focus on. Okay, Carolyn, anything in uh, LD17 that needs fixing? And you're muted. Just a heads up. Thank you, Hank. Um, I think the state controls the, the state highways. And in Pima County, our state highways are in pretty good shape. The, the roads that need fixing are the county and city roads and also the roads in the rural areas. How they get the money to do this, I'm not quite sure. But I think one of the things that might help would be for the state to insist that the bonds that the voters approve for roads and infrastructure actually get used for the projects that they're uh, proposed to improve. Okay, and let's talk a little bit about the border. I think um, that is a huge uh, issue on voters' minds, especially Republican voters' minds uh, this year. And I want to, obviously, border enforcement is largely a federal issue, but policymakers can play a role in it, too. And I wonder, what is the plan? If I think I'm having a hard time hearing you. I'm sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. I'll, I'll speak up. Uh, hopefully. It's That's better. Hard. Thank you. Just a little bit closer to the computer here. I apologize. <laughs> uh, what is your plan as a state lawmaker to help secure our so southern border with Mexico? What can you do as, you know, somebody who is not in Congress uh, to ensure that the border is secure? And why don't we start with Sherilyn this time? It's, it's difficult, Hank, because most of the border of Arizona is actually on federal land and the state has no control over those areas. So in terms of, of completing the border wall, it would be very difficult to do. Um, Texas, our government is supposed to protect the states from invasion. And if we consider uncontrolled immigration as an invasion, the way Texas is doing, then we have some options. We can actually send our National Guard to the border and charge the government for those expenses. And do you think we should do that, Sherilyn? That's a good question, Hank. I think we should be doing, we're, we're gonna have to consider doing something. I think, I think we really have a problem with, with um, the uncontrolled immigration and the fact that it's also contributing to the problems with the cartels, with drugs coming into our country, with sex trafficking. And I think if this is our only option, it should definitely be considered. 
Okay. Anna, what do you think? Should we, uh, should the governor invoke his war powers and declare an invasion on the border? Absolutely. I would implore him to do something immediately. Our open border situation is a, is not only a critical threat to our nation, but it's especially critical to, to our state safety. I mean, at, at an obvious level, the crimes, the drugs, the trafficking have to stop. And we've been told that there's people coming in from over 160 countries around the world. I mean, the chaos is abound. And we, we, we see it and experience it first in our safety and in our economy because it puts a burden on our social services, um, our schools, our, uh, educa our the education, um, our border patrol, our police. The, the state has an obligation to protect its citizens. And it's, it's not likely that the legislature has the authority alone to do anything at all other than maybe appropriations. And, and I'm a, a, a proponent of the wall. I know that, that because we're on federal land, it's very, very different from the way Texas has been able to, to get a handle on it. But um, it is, it's not a cure-all, but it's an important factor um, that, that helps eliminate one level of, of border security. But I, I would want to have Arizona engage its resources in some way, uh, at, similar to how Texas has tried to find a way to make this happen. Um, so I'm supportive of any measures that are gonna help stop the flow of unknowns in order to regroup and, and have time to plan on how to deal with it. I know some ideas, uh, and I, I can't speak in detail about them, but I know that that we can prevent sanctuary policies in counties or cities by empowering some of our, our, our residents to take legal action by suing those officials who thwart immigration law enforcement. And that is something that if, if it finally hits the person who's making that decision at our detriment, they should be held accountable. So that's something just um, on the surface that I think we could do, but Yes. Do I believe that we should take uh, a front seat to taking care of our own citizens at 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 the level that uh, that we're able to? Then yes, I, I would support anything in that respect. And I've got a follow up from a member of the audience here. How would you seek to influence federal law as a state legislator? I think we all agree, you know, it's mostly a problem that Congress has to deal with. I, I can't hear you, yeah. Hank. I apologize, Sherilyn. Uh, how would you seek to influence federal law as a state lawmaker? A follow-up question from the audience. I think we all have agreed that this is largely a federal issue. What can you do to prod our congressmen to take action? Okay. Uh, well, I think obviously the chaos happening right now at the border is because of the decisions made through the Biden administration. And it's cutting us at the knees trying to have sovereignty and safety for our for our own citizens, and we we know that that's the underlying issue. So on a state level, maybe our state senators haven't shown clear deference to our needs either to address this. So as a legislator, I, I would like to see and support um, policy that would enforce or the uh, encourage isn't enough, but would would um, make our legislators who can represent us in this fashion uh, more obligated to be able to do their job. Because you're right, a, a, a legislator cannot do that, but we do have uh, the ability to encourage our, uh, our Congress to step in and, and, and make an effort for policy that would uh, that would work within what we need them to do. Okay, and and Sherilyn, how how the follow up question from the audience: How specifically can you prod federal policymakers to take action on the border? What would your style be? How would you go about that? Hank, I think I think citizens have made it very clear that they're very concerned about what's going on at the border. And I think they've let their legislators know that. The fact that the legislators aren't taking the kind of action that's required, I think means that we need to replace them. And that's about 
the best we can do at this time is just elect people that are gonna listen to us and address our concerns. Okay. And so um, immigration isn't just illegal immigration. Um, there are a lot of legal immigrants. There are a lot of uh, asylum seekers specifically right now, refugees coming to Arizona from around the world, resettling here. Uh, many of our top leaders in both parties have welcomed them. I'm curious, do you believe Arizona should continue refugee resettlement? And if so, what, if any limits, should there be on resettling uh, asylum seekers, refugees here in Arizona? And why don't we start with you this time, Sherilyn? I think, I feel very concerned about what's going on in the world and the refugees. I, I wish we could take them all in and provide for them, but we really can't. And I think that the fact that we, they are coming in without any sort of evaluation, we don't know who they are, we don't know where they're coming from, we don't know their background, we don't know whether they're terrorists or not, I think that needs to be stopped. I think they need, we need to have a policy where we evaluate these people much better than what's being done. One of the things that I think about was the Afghanistan situation where we had all these Americans and allies that we couldn't get out of Afghanistan, and yet our planes were full of people just coming over here from Afghanistan that we didn't know who they were, what they were coming for. I think that's a very bad policy. I think it needs to stop. I think we need to evaluate, evaluate these refugees and make sure that they're actually refugees who need asylum and not just people who want a better life in America. We can't afford to take care of them all. Okay, thank you. And Anna, same question. Um, do you believe we should continue refugee resettlement and what, if any, limits should there be on it? Well, I know a a buzz phrase is we are a country of immigrants and we all know that as as Sherilyn said and I have my own story uh, our forefathers came as Im immigrants but I can assure you that when they came as immigrants they were not given free cell phones they were not given rent they were not given money they were not given social services and so what's happening right now is a great burden that that is put on our taxpayers and it it's demoralizing because when a when you get your tax bill and you pay your taxes, um, you expect that it's your government is going to take care of your needs, and and what we're seeing is that the the way in which illegal immigration is being uh, catered to, it it's it's unfair to Americans and to Arizonans. I think that that we. We can have, I think we, I mean, simply speaking, we might stop, curb the tide at this point right now, but there are many ways to position ourselves so that it benefits our economy, um, so that we can use immigration to benefit the United States and, uh, and in the interest of, Air, uh, of America, have visas, have, uh, I think there's other countries that have a system where uh, immigrants can come in. And, and we just, we haven't done that. We've made it a, a all or nothing um, spin on, on immigration. And it's not, it shouldn't be that way. We can't compare to what happened four, five, six generations ago when people came and uh, to make a, a better life for themselves that, as to what's happening right now. And so I think that it needs to be stopped. We need, as I said, to, to just stop, regroup, and decide how to deal with this situation. Okay, let's move on to education questions. We've got a lot of these coming in from the audience, a couple of that I've prepared ahead of time. Let's start with a yes or uh, a no. Do you believe Arizona's K-12 public education is adequately funded? Yes or no? Anna, we, we can just shout them out at this point. That's not a yes or no question. I would have to decide, you would have to define what does adequately funded mean? That's, that's it right there. In your mind, is it adequately funded? Yes or no? Well, then I guess I would have to say yes, because I don't know what we're trying to adequately fund. So Thank yes. 
Carolyn, is it adequately funded? Our K-12 education system, more money, less money? Well, the, the way it's funded is per pupil. And um, each year, the funding per pupil is increased by inflation and then another 10% on top of that. So it seems like that should be funding it pretty well. And at this point, uh, funding of education is more than half the entire state budget. So I would have to say, yes, I think education is adequately funded. Okay, I had some follow-up questions to uh, grill you both on where the mo this money would come from if you said it wasn't adequately funded, but I guess we can skip <laughs> okay, Another one from the audience. Um, what kind of support do you need in the classroom and how can state lawmakers assist in getting them what they need? Essentially, what are they not getting from the current legislature that they should receive? Is there anything that comes to mind? And let's start with you, Sherilyn. Okay, you're going to have to repeat the question, Hank. I'm, you know, I can't hear you or my computer is cutting out. I apologize. So what kind of support do teachers need and how can state lawmakers assist in getting them those things? Essentially, what are they not getting that the legislature can help provide, if anything? Hank, um, as you know, I, I have a teaching credential. And I also served on the school board. And I will tell you quite frankly that the thing that is hurting teachers the most, that's making most teachers leave education is the fact that discipline in the classroom is not being enforced. It's totally out of control. In, in middle school and high school, the teachers are actually fearful of the students. And what needs to be done is the administration needs to back up these teachers. When they have discipline problems, they need help, they need support, they need to be backed up. Obviously, we, what we'd like is for teachers to have smaller classrooms, for teachers to be paid better. Um, but I think the important thing that's causing teachers to leave right now is really the issue of discipline in the schools. Sherilyn, I want to follow up with that. You say we, we would like smaller classroom sizes and for teachers to be paid better, but you didn't. You said that the, the, the education system is being adequately funded right now. I, I'd like you to explain that a little bit. If the system is being adequately funded, but teachers aren't being paid well enough and classroom sizes are too large, what's going wrong here? I think uh, what I'm saying is that I think One of the problems is that teachers are not receiving enough of the funding. I think there's too much administration taking away too much of the funding and not enough of the money actually going into the classroom to the teachers and the kids. Okay, gotcha. And Anna, same question back to the original here. Um, what kind of support do teachers need in the classroom? and? You know, it, it can what can lawmakers do to provide them with that support? Well, I I can appreciate, <clears throat> excuse me, the difficulty uh, that teachers <clears throat> have. Uh, I I can't imagine what it's like to try to uh, keep thirty kids in check and be able to have them leave with knowledge that they we're empowered to be able to give them. So uh, as far as what I would give teachers, I, I think that's that's just a sliver of the big, the big issue. And I think the issue is one, you wanted to know if it was it was uh, adequately funded. And I and I think I mentioned before that education in general is a partisan vote. We find that the left is always in favor of of them or the experts being the decision-making uh, entity and the right wants the parents to be in control and therefore there therein lies the the natural conflict so um to just throw money at i would love in a perfect world with rainbows and unicorns i would love to give teachers more money but my question is we've accepted a system of funding education where it uses up the budget and then asks the legislator, legislature for more money 
with no accountability as to how the money was spent. I mean, I'd like to know years of adding to the education system, teachers are still underpaid. I mean, why is that? Uh, I would like to see the books and the audits. I mean, what exactly are the things that this, the, the, the $14.25 billion are paid for? What and where is it going? Why is it that superintendents have high, high salaries and teachers still have low, low salaries? What, what are we paying on transportation? Where, you know, what are we paying on the gas, especially now, the energy costs, the books, vendor contracts, building contracts and budgets? I mean, what does adequate funding look like? Because do we have adequate funding for teachers? No, but we keep as taxpayers now, and I, I was in that same space as, as a parent, So, but as, as a taxpayer, to have to continually give money to the education system without accountability or to know what's happening, where is that aggregate spending going? So for me, I would want to ask, are children gleaning life skills and critical thinking skills? Are they are their reading, writing, and math competencies getting better? Are they leaving with the ability to take care of themselves and be a functional part of society? Um, so for me, I'm, I'm kind of a transformation person. I think in terms of process engineering or performance measures. So I like to look at what's broken and what's fixed. And then looking at all the inefficiencies first is where I start, or we would start before blanketly increasing a budget and saying, how would I help a teacher? Well, I mean, there's a lot of ways that we could, but we, we need to know what's what needs to be addressed first. I, I grew up in, 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 in public schools, and I don't think we want anyone wants to see public schools go away, but we simply need to be able to create a better framework, not only for the success of our children, but for the benefit of our teachers so that we keep good teachers. And, and, I find that really, I'm sorry to interrupt. I find that really interesting that both of you have said that, you know, teachers deserve more pay, um, yet the, you know, the education system as a whole has plenty of money. We need to reorganize our priorities within that. Exactly. And I'd like to ask a follow-up. What should the starting salary for a brand new teacher in a public school in Arizona be? What would be a you know, a rate of pay that you think is fair, just, and will keep people in the profession. Anna, you mind if we start with you? How much should a brand new teacher make? Fresh out of college, first job. Well, um, I have three children who just graduated from college and they work very hard. They work long hours. In fact, I just talked to my daughter who said, I am working straight through and I have to be on a conference call at one o'clock in the morning. So all college graduates, have a different pay scale for their uh, for their skills. Now, teaching is a nine month job obligation. And so you go into teaching knowing what you're getting into. You don't expect to go into teaching and expect to make what a, an engineer possibly might be making. It's, a, it's, it's, it's different altogether, but uh, I would say we would have to take into account uh, the time period in which they're expected to work, the nine months, and, and base it against what somebody who works 12 months out of the year and uh, give it a percentage from that aspect. So it's, I, I would have to know what a teacher is getting paid today and in order to say what would be adequate, because just out of the blue, I, I'm not comfortable answering that. You can't say how much a teacher should be paid? No, I mean, I don't know. No, I, I don't think it'd be fair to be held to that amount if, I don't, if I don't know all, you, of, all of the- uh, Sorry, Anna. we're moving on. Sherilyn, can you say how much a teacher should be paid? No, I can't, Hank. I think, I think the market would determine those kind of things. Where, where the teaching position takes place, what kind of uh, background the teachers are required to have, what kind of backup they've got in the schools. I think that if you're paying teachers enough that they will come to work, and if you're not paying them enough, you won't have teachers and you'll have to raise the pay. Okay, so increase it until we hit that sweet spot when they stop leaving. <laughs> 
Uh, I want to ask a little bit, we mentioned, you know, we were talking about public schools, but um, one of the great debates in Arizona education system always centers around empowerment scholarship accounts, ESAs. Um, these uh, allow students, families to use taxpayer dollars that would ordinarily go to a public school to attend a private school, parochial school instead. Um, though currently only specific groups of students can access the ESAs. So my question is, do you believe that these programs should be extended to all Arizona students or should it stay restricted to the handful of groups that are currently allowed in the to get ESAs? And, and Sherilyn, why don't we start with you? I am a great proponent of public education, but I think our public education system presently is failing our children. A third, I, of our third graders, 60% are not even performing at grade level. This is by third grade. So it, it only gets worse. And I think with some of the stuff that the critical race theory, the sexual sexuality education, I think some parents are feeling very, very uncomfortable with what's going on in the schools. And they are taking their children out of public schools and putting them in private schools and charter schools. And I think they should have that option, especially as taxpayers, they're paying this money to educate their children. And if the children aren't gonna get a good education in public schools and they feel like they need to put their children somewhere else, I think we should have a program where the money actually goes to the student and follows the student. The other thing is a lot of parents um, put their children in charter schools and private schools during COVID because our public schools were not even open to our children. So I think that if, if parents really are concerned about the education their children are getting in public schools, they should be able to take them out. Their taxpayer dollars should go to their kids. And I really hope that there's more we can do as legislators and as voters and as citizens to improve our public schools because I really want them to be good. Thank you. And Anna, what, what do you think? I, yes, I agree. And the, what I can, I, I totally agree. I, I can, what I would add to that is that I blanketly, I say that ESA should be available to all K through 12 parents, not only for the reasons that that Sherilyn mentioned, but uh, it also creates healthy competition, just like it does in the private sector with businesses. Uh, when the public school system has become similar to having a monopoly on education. And what happens is the, the it's an end all with what it is that the public school administration wants to do. Uh, and some of the, the the criteria that I was reading on ESAs, it, it's, it shouldn't just be for a small group of people. It, it's just the irony. Public school is supposed to be for everyone, yet ESAs only apply if you have had this, this, or that happen in your family, or you come from this kind of family, or, and it's, it's unfair. I mean, it, it, it should be available to all families. Yes, the money should follow the child. It, what it would do is it would make the public school system become more aware that if they want to have the funding for their system, for the system itself, those administration administrators and the policymakers within the education system are going to have to do a better job so that parents aren't feeling like they have to take them out of public school so that their children are getting the kind of education that they want. The other thing is that education, it, it, they, it's not a place, I, I didn't send my children to school to be indoctrinated on, on a social subject or, or, or decide, have a teacher decide how I want my child to be raised. And so that's what's happening in the public school system is that they're more concerned in, in, in generally speaking on making sure that, that, that they're following certain social criteria but at the end of the day we can't be sure that that they're competent in academics and critical thinking skills so uh so i again 
to make a, a short story long, I'm back to ESA should be available to all K through 12 parents. Thank you. All right, let's talk a little bit about elections. I think you both indicated at uh, the outset that you think that the um, that there were serious uh, problems uh, with the 2020 election in Arizona. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong. Um, but my question, if I'm right, is what type of election fraud is happening exactly? And what is your plan to stop it? And Anna, let's start with you. OK. Well, um, I think we we can those we can all agree that there are at least eight, 81 million people who aren't happy with the result. So something did not go right. And the fact that we have had uh, evidence come out to prove that there's been uh, mismanagement in the in the way ballots were handled. Uh, that dead people are getting were getting uh, ballots and and that family members have checked the status of their uh, deceased family member and it shows that they have voted. Those are that's all proof that things were not going right. The other thing that we can say we can say happened is that there's our our voter rolls showed that people are voting in two different areas, two different states. They also have shown that people have gotten multiple uh, ballots. I mean, we have people who've actually shown that. We have a candidate who himself has shown that he has got three ballots all by himself. Um, we know that there was ballot harvesting, which is Ill already illegal in, the, uh, in Arizona. We can't have more than three. And there's video, I, I, I myself, have had a personal experience of someone coming to uh, one of my college students' doors and asking them that to if they wanted him to take his ballots. They said no, and he said, "I'll come back tomorrow. I can help you fill it out." And there was five of them living in that house. So there's 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 a lot of different um, factors to how we know that there was mismanagement, deceit, and fraud that occurred. So how I would fix that, I mean, there's a lot of things in, in session right now that it's, it's, it's a fluid kind of um, topic because what I would like to see, Hank, is one day, one vote, ID required, uh, and that it be audit and trans, um, transparent. Just like in my business, at any point in time, the IRS can come and audit me. So I have to make sure that I have clean books and that it's audit proof, audit transparent. And I think that of the one thing that sets us apart out of any other country in the world was the fact that our voting system was something that I cherished and most Americans do. And so this is something that I would like to see implemented, whether it's this legislature that's doing it now and where I would come in to continue to support that effort of one day, one vote, ID required. And I, I do want to circle back to the idea of one day, one vote. But uh, Sherilyn, uh, first, let's let's finish this thread. Um, what kinds of uh, voter fraud do you believe are happening in Arizona? And how do you stop it? Well, since, since the, the early 1990s, one party or the other has felt that the election was untrustworthy. Um, Gore, Gore thought you couldn't trust the election. Hillary Clinton thought you couldn't trust the election. Donald Trump thought you couldn't trust the election. I think voters deserve a process that makes them feel confident that our elections are honest and reliable. Um, how we do that, I think, number one, we really need to clean up our voter rolls. Um, when I walk precincts getting my nominating petitions, I, I can tell you the voter rolls are a mess. Um, I think we need, we need to do away with ballot harvesting. We need to, if we're going to have drop boxes, they need to be monitored. Otherwise, we need to get rid of them. We need IDs. We need to make sure that our voters are American citizens. 
and um, what else? Uh, I, I'm not totally opposed to mail-in ballots because I know there's so many people who rely on mail-in ballots. 85% of our voters now are voting by mail and I think we need to make sure that there is a good chain of custody for these mail-in ballots. Okay, that was actually leading right into my next question is, you know, there's a lot of talk these days about eliminating mail and early voting altogether. Sounds like you wouldn't support that. Am I correct, Sherilyn? I, I would love to support it, but I think that the voting public would not be in favor of it. I, I heard from a lot of constituents um, that they are very reliant on mail-in voting and especially elderly people who have a hard time getting to the polls. Um, I wouldn't want to disenfranchise them. Um, it's possible that we could use mail-in voting um, more in a more limited way, have people apply for so-called absentee ballots if they actually have problems getting into the polls. But I think for right now that I would be more concerned about making sure that we had a good chain of custody for those ballots and good voter, good reliable voter rolls. Okay. And Anna, same question. Do you support fully eliminating both mail and early ballot uh, voting as many people have discussed this year? And that's, that's a difficult question because as Sherilyn said, we do have a lot of people that have that use it, but some it you have you can't have everything. You can't you can't expect to have a good chain of custody when you have mail in ballots. And so what I've been I've talked to a lot of people, as I'm sure all the candidates have, and and that always comes up where they want in election integrity, they want to have a secure uh, uh, process, but oh by the way, don't you know I don't want to give up my mail in ballot. Well. I think that we would have to, uh, and one thing that I try to explain to people is, is that if you can make the effort to go to the doctor, you either get somebody to drive you there, or you know you have um, uh, somebody come pick you up and take you to the doctor, bring you back. If we had a day where we voted, that's the day that you make sure you have somebody take you over there. Being able to vote is a privilege and it is a, a right and a privilege, but something that we, we should just be honored to be able to do. And if you can get up out of your house, out of your chair, go out the door, either drive or take somebody else to another event or to a doctor, you can take them to go vote. And I think that I know that that that's probably not a popular answer with people who, who go on vacation and say, well, I, you know, I want to be able to vote. But that's, that was part of the issue, is we had people voting in two different states. And um, to have uh, the mail-in ballot really should only be for our, our uh, military abroad and specific situations. I mean, if you want to think about it, do you remember when we all had to have a uh, uh, or we, not all of us, when the handicapped sticker that you could have on your car, how many times can you think about having driven into a parking lot and you have somebody else driving into a handicapped parking space that gets up, hops out and walks out? They're in no way handicapped, but they are the driver for somebody else who has. Well, that's very similar with the ballot is that you can't ensure who it is that's going to be filling out that ballot. And so we do have to eliminate the mail-in ballot and early ballot. If you really want to vote, then you will make an effort to be somewhere and, and, and confirmed that that's where you're going to vote. And I, and I think that in order for us to have what we want, which is a secure uh, election process, we do have to get rid of it. Okay, I want to follow up on that. Um, have either of you ever voted by mail? Oh, yeah. I, I didn't ask for it, and it came in the mail uh, one year. Absolutely. But, but, but what we've done is we've taken our ballot on every other year and taken it to the poll on Election Day. So, yes, you're, I have. I don't know about you, Sherilyn. <laughs> you regularly use a mail-in ballot, though. You just drop it off at the polls. Is that what you're saying? 
I, yes, I took it to the poll on election day one year. I did that. Well, I, part of it was because I was, I was helping at the polls. So, um, and I wasn't helping at my poll, my precinct poll. But, uh, but I do think, I mean, I think it would affect all of us. It's not convenient, Hank. I mean, would I rather just turn it in? Yes, I'd rather just turn it in, but I can't trust that it's gonna be uh, adequately or, or even counted correctly. And I can't, I, it's something that I would have to sacrifice as well, but it, I don't believe we should have the mail-in ballot. I have seen it be part of the, the biggest problem altogether. Carolyn, do you vote by, vote by mail? Actually, Hank, I love to go to the polls. I always go to the polls. I just, it, it makes me feel like I'm really fulfilling my responsibility as, as a citizen. Um, I did last year or a year before last, we were going to be on vacation and weren't going to be in town during the primary. And I did request an absentee ballot. So that was the one time I did do that. Okay. And I did not realize how much time we have already run through here. So I'm going to try to uh, trim just to the uh, kind of essential things that I think we should hit on, things that have come up repeatedly in um, questions from the audience. And uh, the most recent one here is uh, about Roe versus Wade. Um, and I, I think the question here from the audience, and let's just throw this one out here right now. Do you support the overturn of Roe versus Wade? And, Clearly, we haven't seen that that is actually the case, what the U.S. Supreme Court is going to do. There's a draft opinion out there on another case, but it very much seems like they are, by and large, throwing out Roe versus Wade. And so I think the question, let's start with a real basic, do you agree with that decision? Assuming it is a decision. <laughs> kind of hard to ask about a draft thing here, but I think you get the gist. Uh, Sherilyn? Hank, I think in any of the legal people will tell you that Roe versus Wade was probably not well decided, that it didn't uh, judicially was not a good opinion. However, we've had it for 50 years, and there are judges who say um, having something decided is more important even than having it decided right. And um, there's a, what's called stare decisis that, that means that once something's decided, it's decided. So to have it overturned like this is going, it, it's going to be difficult for everyone, I think. Um, it's gonna, if it does get overturned, it goes back to the states and each state will make their own regulations regarding abortion, um, abortion laws. Okay, and, and that's my follow-up question there. But first, Anna, do you agree with um, the draft decision that we've seen from the U.S. Supreme Court? Well, this, this question. I am clearly pro-life. As a mother of three beautiful children, I have never been more certain that life should be honored and protected from conception. However, I don't pretend to know that what it's like for a woman who has been raped or is a victim of incest or has, is in a life-threatening situation. And it has to be difficult. It should be a difficult decision for, for them to have to make and not just a, a flippant choice for birth control. So I, I don't agree with the idea of uh, late-term abortion. I think it's an abomination. And as a legislature, as a legislator, Arizona law, it's already in place. So regardless of what happens with Roe versus Wade, I mean, we already have a law. We allow for 20 weeks for circumstances as such. And then after that, it's treated as murder. Uh, but I think that the bigger picture, the bigger question rather, that we should be asking is how did we get, how did our society get to the point of asking if and when it's okay to kill a baby in the womb? I mean, just saying that is disgusting for me. But what other options besides abortion are we offering to society as legislatures? I mean, moral responsibility is lacking in our culture. Adoption is almost impossible. And the, and the and CPS system is dysfunctional and scary. 
uh, I have volunteered within that system and I wanted to run out screaming. So we need to have solutions that people can count on if they can't raise a child. So as a legislator, I would hope that we would be asking those questions and more so than just, you have to have this baby or you will be prosecuted for murder. So I don't really feel that having to discuss Roe versus Wade, it was a bad decision. I mean, uh, uh, we know that, that anything that goes through the court isn't necessarily truth. It's just what they could prove at that time. And so um, I, I, I think that's what, as a legislator, that's what I would want to focus on is how are we helping women in those situations have different options and why? Why are we having this conversation to begin with? It's 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 a sad state of affairs when when we have we're the most wonderful country in the world and we're fighting over how old a baby in the womb should be before we can kill it. It's it's beyond. And I want to follow up on that because Sherilyn made a great point that you know if we no longer have a federally protected right to abortion. Um, it falls to the states to determine their rules. That will make your votes incredibly important um, in the lives of millions of Arizonans. Um, I'm curious, what situations, if any, do you think abortion should be abortion should be legal? And oh, Hank, as as an as a retired OBGYN doctor, I I have seen women who've been raped. I've seen women who have obstetrical injuries so severe that they leak urine and feces all the time. I've seen women who have babies who died in the uterus. I've seen women who have babies that have anomalies that are not incompatible with life outside the uterus. Um, I'm very pro-life, but I'm not an absolutist. I am opposed to late-term abortions and abortions of viable babies, but I would not want to see early abortions criminalized. Okay, Anna, same question. Where do we draw the line? It's gonna be up to you as a lawmaker if you are allowed. Well, I, as, as I said before, the, the law is in place. And as a legislator, I will follow that law. And we allow already allow for 20 weeks for circumstances that we have just discussed. Uh, but that's that's not the the reason most people are having abortions. I think statistically, it's as birth control, and that in itself is is a problem. So we already allow for 20 weeks of of, of, of in vitro life. So um, after that, it, it's treated as murder, and I I think that our constituency will play a big role in telling us what they want us to do. Well, and, I should, I should clarify. Can, I, can I respond, Hank? Um, I, I, I do not believe that women use abortion as birth control. I think for most women, it's, it's a crisis in their life. It's an agonizing decision. And it's not something that women take lightly. No, I, I, I'd like to respond to that. I don't think that those that that it is, I'm saying that I, and I did not make this statistic up. I wish I had, uh, I can find it, but I'm sure one of you will and let me know. Uh, but it is not most people who decide to get an abortion. It's not based on, on rape or incest. It is, it's a, a percentage of those. And for those situations, as I said before, it has to be a very difficult decision and it should be. Um, so I, the question is, at what point would, would it be okay? I think it's what you're, you're asking, right? So my answer would be that as a legislator, I'm obligated to follow the law and the law already allows for 20 weeks. And that's, that's the part I wanted to clarify. Um, the legislature did pass a 15 week abortion ban and we have laws on the books that have not been enforced um, dating back to territorial days, strictly criminalizing abortion that many activists um, in the pro-life movement believe will 
become activated again should Roe v. Wade be struck down. So I think it's important to voters to hear from you directly where you personally feel the line should be drawn. Is that at 20 weeks? Is that what you're telling me? Or if we go back to these territorial laws that say any kind of abortion at any point is illegal, is that the law you're go you think we should follow? I think it requires a lot more discourse. I think that every situation is different. I personally, as I said, I personally believe that life begins at conception. So it, it is a, a very difficult step to want to, to agree that it, it should be allowed for any given amount of time. But I'm not, a, I'm not a doctor, so I can't tell you scientifically, specifically, what would happen if to at what, what at what stage specifically at uh, uh, a fetus is at 10 weeks compared to 23 weeks. Uh, I'm sure Sherilyn would be able to answer that a little bit more clearly. But I it's it's a sad state of affairs as I that we are actually talking about this. And so I I would want I would support legislation that called for less uh, or a lower a, um, a lower amount of weeks yes i would fewer than 15 weeks fewer than 15 weeks i i i, I don't, you know what i'm not going to answer that because i don't know i mean we if i said something like 16 weeks three days and four hours i mean i i i don't know hank and i i I'm not going to answer that. I think I've already given you my answer. But it's an important issue to voters. And well, I think what's important to voters is is knowing that at the time when we go in to make legislation on policies that's going to affect everyone, we also have to remember that we we have to protect life. It's it's in our constitution and it's our moral obligation. But I'm not I'm not going to give you a weak answer. I think, as I said, I believe that life begins at conception. And I, but I will follow the law and uh, we'll look at all sides. And I think that everybody deserves uh, an opportunity to talk about why they, they feel differently uh, in their personal situation. But no, I won't give you that answer, Hank. So let's move on or talk about something else. Let's move on to closing statements. Carolyn, why don't you start us off? Well, I'm running for the legislature because I think I can do a very good job. I think I've got a lot of experience in a lot of different areas. I know a lot about education. I know a lot about health care. I ran my own medical practice. I know a lot about small business. I think I could bring a lot of expertise to the office. I'm I'm retired, my husband's retired, we don't have small children at home. I can spend the time in the legislature that the job really requires and I'll be happy to do it because I want our state to be successful. I want people to be prosperous. I want our economy to be good. So I'm hoping that you will vote for me and I will work very hard to do a very good job for you. Thank you, Sherilyn. We appreciate your time. And Anna, your closing statements, please. Okay, well, again, I'm Anna Orth, and I'm uh, grateful to you, Hank, and uh, to uh, the Clean Elections Commission to have us here and give us this forum to speak to our constituency about the issues, their relevance in this race and in the legislature, and to bring to light why having the right person in this office is very important. Um, I did mention that as a fourth generation Tucson, I have a vested interest in this community uh, in Tucson and Southern Arizona. And, I, and it's been an integral part of my life and me, uh, the community that I've lived in. And it's given me the credibility with many voters like you uh, from having lived here, worked here and volunteered here the majority of my life. Um, and my professional experience in business and schooling can offer the legislature the capability and skill sets that help to bring opposing mindsets, uh, to work together, to look at the bigger picture and create solutions together that are gonna focus to benefit all Arizonans. Um, I've already raised my children. They are now grown and my husband is, is still working and he provides an income for us. So 
that opens up the blessing for me to have the ability to, to focus full time on being your legislator. Um, I, I would be available to take your calls, your emails and requests from our constituency. Uh, I would have the time to research, to listen and create legislation that supports the needs of you, of us, the voters of Arizona. So I hope I am able to, to, to work for you, to answer your questions, to be the kind of leader that you want to give you not only common sense legislation, but to communicate those, um, those policies to you so that um, you feel confident in, in knowing that I'm representing you appropriately and with effectiveness and, and fight for what, what you believe is right uh, as, as a citizen of Arizona. So I wanna thank you for listening and I, I hope again that you remember to vote for me on August 2nd. Thank you both so much for showing up. I think that shows a lot of character that you uh, decided to participate in today's debates. Um, that's it. Uh, to the voters, we thank you, all of you who took the time to watch this debate and inform yourselves before the August 2nd primary election. As a reminder, the voter registration deadline is July 5th and early voting be begins July 6th. All registered voters, including independent voters, can participate in the primary, although independent voters need to request a partisan ballot, either a Democratic or Republican ballot. We encourage you to visit clean election, azcleanelections.gov. Let me say that again, azcleanelections.gov for official, accurate voting information. And again, thank you both so much, Sherilyn and Anna, for agreeing to participate in today's debate. Thank you. Thank you, Hank. Good luck. Bye -bye.